Trader Merlin Show. It is your Thursday edition, the tail end of the week, the first day of June, and I guess the second month of continual construction. So they're actually right outside the window today. You'll probably hear some hammers and saws and maybe even some hooting and hollering going on in Spanish because they're just screaming over there having their modelos, which, by the way, number one selling beer in the world today. Um, actually, in the United States. Today's going to be an interesting show. Normally, I've been doing these shows alone for quite some time, and uh, as you guys know, I've been writing articles for BarChart.com, and John Rowland has been on the program several times talking about natural gas, crude oil, and we thought, let's do something rather different. John is very well-versed in just about every aspect of technical analysis, and we were talking the other day, and he goes, man, I've got this new pattern I found. I'm going to name it. It's a proprietary. It's called the Powell Hammer, and I thought, you know what? That sounds fantastic. Let's talk about the Powell Hammer. So that's our, our day for today. You guys can see the graphic here. Trading the Powell Hammer with John Rowland. I did put a picture of uh, Jerome Powell with a giant mallet and some data behind it. Thank you, AI, for that. But without further ado, we've got coming to us from the East Coast, Mr. John Rowland. How you doing, my friend? How are you doing, Marlon? Well, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure having you on. What's new in your world? What you been up to? Uh, same old, same old. Working hard with the uh, bar chart, creating... Uh, Educational content, uh, webinars, free webinars that are on Wednesdays. And then we have a uh, show on Fridays for our premier members called Market Unclose. And so we kind of look at the macro, we do some micro, we look at some trading opportunities and just showcase some of the tools that are on uh, bar chart for our premier members to help them, you know, maximize the, the utility of the, the website. Well, I will say, um, real quick, I'll just share it over here. If you go to barchart.com, everybody, if you click on that Learn tab, you'll see there's a bunch of webinar recordings, and then I'll give you um, a bunch of upcoming and previous ones that have been done by John and his team over there. Um, tell me about your, your latest, I guess, not invention, but your identification. You came up with this idea called the, the Powell Hammer, and it sounds so ominous. There's obviously the Powell Put, which, you know, that's a totally different topic. But what is this Powell Hammer, and how do you use it? Well, you know, when you talk about technical analysis, no matter what, whatever theory that you believe in, the EMH or behavior of finance or supply and demand, or no, however you define it, right? It all boils down to what makes price move, and that comes down to, you know, imbalance between buyers and sellers. And so price patterns or candlestick patterns or bar patterns are – a reflection of you know these these imbalances and so what i noticed was there was a pattern that i saw that was created on a very specific day two days actually and that after that pattern was created once price returned to it and it, what it turns out to be is a supply zone the first time it market came back to it, any any market any of these uh, equities stocks came back to it it was getting a usually getting a large reaction and then the, you know like in true supply and demand the second the reaction would be a little bit more muted and then maybe on the third time what we'd see is that price would pause and then after price um was able to penetrate above this level it was creating an impulse move and then like in typical uh chart mechanics you know, old resistance becomes new support, and then price would continue away. So let, let me share. You don't mind if I share for a second? I never mind. I think my audience would prefer it if you shared over. Let's get some some graphics up there. Okay. So um, so what I just have here is a watch list of just some examples, and let's go let's go through those um, examples. So in bar chart, we have something called flip charts. So this gives us an opportunity. To, to look at uh, a lot of charts really quickly. So let's go back. And the date that I'm talking about is August 25th. Now let's talk about the narrative that was happening at that time. Uh, you know, the Fed was saying that they were data dependent. And what we had gotten was during that week is we got some data. And I don't remember exactly what it was, if it was the CPE or the CPI or whatever it was, but it was basically the narrative that was coming out of the market was that 
the Fed was going to pause or maybe even think about cutting rates because what we finally saw was uh, a retraction or a slowing down in, in inflation. And so I'm just going to move this bar out of the way. So and just so, so what happened? So I can clarify that date, by the way, the August 22nd was the Jackson August 25th. Hulse, uh, yeah, it was the Jackson Hole Symposium where Jerome Powell said, "Expect to feel some pain in our markets," and the market went, "Oh my goodness!" And well, I think it was the next day, wasn't it? It was it the Thursday, Friday, or Friday, thir- Thursday, Friday. So I think it, what it was is the market had this narrative beforehand and jumped ahead, right? Right, and then the next day was the reaction to Powell's um, basically came out and said, and it was a, I think it was a two word phrase that people jumped on to was higher and longer, right? right. So, yep. uh, and that was that's why I came up with the name with the Powell hammer because he literally hammered the market and says, no, 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 you're not going to go up anymore. Right, we're not going to see an ease of financial conditions, and anything which you're going to see is, you know, tightening of financial conditions. And then that's when price started the fall in all of uh, a lot, all the equities. And and what I have here is the the, the S and P index. And so you know you can kind of see this here. And I want to kind of blow this up really large so you can see it. And the candlestick pattern, like we talked about beforehand in the pre-show is really just a giant engulfing candle, right? You have this green, small body green candle, and then you have this large body red candle that engulfs the green candle. Now, how you draw the zone, depending on the candles here is, you know, you want to use the lower, the low of the green candle to draw the beginning of the zone. And then the high of the red candle would be, the upper level of the zone. And so what we would see here is now this is, acts as a supply zone. Now, why is this a supply zone? When you think about it, you know, new buyers came in on that exuberance and then the pal hammer, you know, knocked them out, which trapped a lot of new length in the market, but also brought in a lot of new selling. And then you can see that when the S&P came back and tested this level, you know, back in, January, early January, then we got that nice reaction away from it. So what I'm saying is what this is just the S&P, but what I started noticing is that and a lot of equities, regardless of when price comes back to it, right? Not particularly on this in this example here in February, but when price came back to it, that, that we were getting the same reaction, this, you know, moving away, this supply zone. And then eventually what we're seeing was as you move forward in time, as we came back and would touch the zone multiple times, the zone was still working, but the impulse moves away. We're getting a lot more muted. And then eventually what we were see, would, would see is that once price eventually broke away, that you would get an impulse. And then that impulse could create an opportunity when price comes back in typical charting uh, mechanics as you know, old resistance becomes new support. So this is just the S&P. So let me give you, um, you know, let's look at Apple. I think Apple does a really nice job at showing the Powell hammer in terms of you know, how we can kind of see the same uh, chart pattern. Again, you notice that little green candle versus that large engulfing red candle. Right. Now, Apple is a little bit unique as we'll we'll come back to that and look at it, um, what's going on currently. But let's look at, like, for instance, and I just picked, you know, some general markets. So here's Coca-Cola. And, you know, l- look at this. You know, we had three touches you know, in a short period of time where, you know, we just couldn't get through the zone and then you get that nice impulse. And then again, here's, you know, a second touch. So this, here's where it was a really a powerful supply zone. And now currently, you know, we're well below it. Um, here's Microsoft. Uh, again, you can see that little green candle and here's the zone. And, you know, there's that first touch and pulse away. And then here's the second touch, right, where, you know, it didn't get a big movement away from it, but it kind of consolidated around it. And then you got the impulse away, retest of the zone, 
and then another impulse away. Johnson and Johnson, you know, notice how we had a lot of touches just right after uh, the creation of the Powell Hammer, and then you get that impulse breakaway, weak test breakaway. And then what we're going to look at in some other examples is as price goes above and below, this level starts acting as kind of like a seesaw or a pivot point as well. And you can see that even after the zone would, would we consider have been used up, how it's it's still price still reacting to this, you know, the zone again, you know, looking at it here where it failed to get above. And also when it finally broke below it, you know, get that nice acceleration away. Uh, here's Norfolk Sun, a, a transportation company, multiple uh, touches at, at that level. And we're still well below it. GE uh, is that example of testing the zone basing impulsing away and becoming a new level of support. Now, why I put Amazon in here is, and this is, I think is really a cool potential trade is notice that Amazon has yet, you know, it did have a, a small touch here very recently after uh, the Powell hammer, but we're now driving towards the Powell hammer, right? So I think this is for, you know, for for a trade opportunity, you know, trends your friend, we're definitely seeing an uptrend. But maybe you could start thinking about this as an area to sell or take profits, or in this case, I think would be a great targeting opportunity. Right. You know, with this, you know, when you look at this, uh, this concept of the, the Powell hammer, you know, obviously this one was created almost a year ago. Um, do you look at different events when Powell speaks or an FOMC announcement and look for that type of setup? And, and because obviously we don't just be a one-off type of candle. I mean, you want to look back and maybe going forward, we have more Powell candles or whoever, Yellen candles, whoever's going to be the next chairman of the SEC or uh, of the FOMC. You know, do you look at that and say, okay, uh, we've now ripped through that one from August and maybe his next speech creates another move similar to that and you mark that one down in your calendar? Well, you know, that's a great question, and, and and I do look at some of the you know, and and certainly we, we you and I both know that we do get some impulse movements or you know large movements when the chairman speaks. But what makes this one unique is that it was universal in terms of the equities markets, and that the reactions that when we get back to it just has a lot of higher probability. Where a lot of the other zones, you know, it, we might get an reaction within a day or two or a week or two weeks later. Or the zone might work, you know, the first time and then the second time, you know, it doesn't have any effect on the price. But this one, because of what happened on that particular day, I just finding that the probabilities that occur around it are a lot, lot stronger. Yeah, well, so, uh, so this is what I think is fascinating about this particular structure is, like you said, it's universal and temporal. In other words, it was created on this this one, these two days, August 25th, August 26th. But as we look at, you know, as we look at other markets, you know, other equities, as we're coming back, it, you know, some of these, you know, we're talking over a year later where we're starting to see a market react to this zone. I mean, that I think is the power of this zone because you know as time goes on a lot of these a lot of times zones lose a lot of their their strength right right because things have changed fundamentals have changed right but if you think about you know behavioral finance and you know supply and demand right this is where our longs were trapped and so they would lo love to get out once price got there. But then, you know, those that were short might have been, you know, that was the time where they would, you know, they were set their risk and then if one price impulses away, you know, that's where they got to get out, right? So, mm -hmm. like, here's Caterpillar, right? 
you know, it was only one candle that reacted to the zone, right? One little red candle, but then we got a gap. Now, I'm wondering if this was an earnings gap. But again, now here we are over a year later, and Caterpillar is coming back to the zone. So, you know, the downtrend for Caterpillar, it definitely isn't a downtrend. But for me, this would say, hey, I would think about looking at a buying opportunity in um, Caterpillar, if the scenarios of what how I define a op buying opportunity played out, but this is going to enhance those levels or enhance that that buying opportunity. Just as I like the, the Amazon, I'm certainly going to look at some trading opportunities that might look for shorting opportunities. Or if I was long at Amazon, which I'm not, that would certainly be in an area that I would look to take profit. So. What is interesting about a caterpillar is it's coming into a net level, you know, where we could say, hey, maybe this is an opportunity for us to buy this or mm -hmm. look at some options plays that I could take, say, knowing that, hey, this is probably most likely going to be a floor and price of caterpillar, you know, in, in, in the short run. Right. So let me um, go back. Unfortunately, I muted my mic because these guys are so loud next door. I didn't want to know the, you guys, the viewers. And unfortunately, I cut my microphone. Um, my original question that you guys didn't get to hear was, you know, when you have an event like this, whether that's Jerome Powell, in this case, it's the Powell hammer because his words caused this action. But it could be an earnings announcement. It could be other major macroeconomic pieces that cause a sudden shift in the markets. You know, it's one of those things to put on your radar and say, OK, let's Let's look and see what happens when price comes back up to those levels. Because clearly, the statement made by Jerome Powell created an imbalance in supply and demand, right? We immediately had more sellers popping in the picture, things tanked from there. Now, I'm not one of those believers that says there's still sell orders sitting from August of 2022 at that level. But I exactly. do know that people like John Rowland and myself are going to look at those price charts. And we're going to go where current prices and look off to the left and go, oh, wow. Look at that huge down move. And if thousands of traders and hedge fund managers are all doing that same thing, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, I, I'm with John. I think that these are great types of patterns to look for. The one piece I will add here, and I'm going to bring up John's chart, is go back to Caterpillar real quick. Uh, when you look at something like Caterpillar's chart, just if you're using these types of levels, and let's say you're, you're looking at the origin of a huge move, which he's got in the red box there, and you notice on that uh, late October, it rallies back up to that 199 line, and you're like, great, I'm going to go short because it's up at the supply level. Always, and I repeat, always, especially if you're trading individual equities, make sure you check your earnings calendar. Because while I normally would say, this looks like a good short at that line, it had earnings that night. And I would never have taken that one short based exactly. on the announcement. Just, just right. like a little, little risk management piece there. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, that is a great point in terms of, you know, what could be the catalyst that drives price through one of these zones or drives price. Right. And so that's goes to Apple. Let's go back to Apple. Am I still showing or yep. sharing? Yeah, you got it. Yep. Okay. So here's our pal hammer. And, you know, we came into that zone and I love, I love you how you and I think the same. <laughs> Not only did the zone, now let, let me kind of zoom into here. So I just want to give you the big picture here. So let's zoom into, let's say, let's three, three months ago. So we came into the hammer zone and we went right to the tip of the zone and we came out. Not only did we come out, but the next day we gapped lower. But guess what saved Apple at this earnings. point? Yeah, yeah, earnings. This was earnings the next day. Boom, and then earnings. But here's where the, this is that power of this zone in terms of, you know, looking for trading opportunities. We got that impulse away from the zone. And then what it, it is now acted as a level of support, a very strong level of support, which took what one, two, three touches here. And now what we're, we're impulsing away. So um, what we could be seeing, for instance, like in the S and P, which is kind of interesting. Now we've had we had three touches inside the zone where it came out, and now we're what we're kind of floundering around of it, and we're getting close to impulsing away. Now, from a technical stand aspect, you know, this forty two hundred level, I think, is you know one of those levels that a lot of technicians are looking at. So for me, this is not this big candle is not a, a, a big enough impulse for me. So one of the things I like to do is 
I like to look at technical analysis and I like the ATR. And so I want to see uh, a multiple of ATR from an impulse level or a breakout level. So for instance, the SPY here or the S&P index is around 45, 46 points. This is the 20 day, but if you look at the nine or the 14, doesn't matter. So I want to see it move a multiple two times outside. So above 4,200, now we're talking about 4090, right? 4095 ish. Mm -hmm. So to me, that would be a confirmation of that impulse away. Now, the only problem that I see for the SP is that just above this breakout, there some could say, you know, would make the argument that, you know, you're coming into another level of supply that was the August high, somewhere around, you know, that 4295, 43 and a quarter. But if you believe in this impulse away, then what we could do is wait for what that, you know, that retest again. And then once this is gone, you know, maybe we can get all the way up to 4,500. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm just saying this is what is starting to play out. And based on what I've seen on other patterns, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the well, power hammer. Well, you and I know, especially looking at price charts like this, that, 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 that picture right there is telling you the story of what are we on now? That start goes all the way back to uh, April. So that's literally a full year of pain, suffering, emotion, greed, right? It's all the reflections of every trader that's traded that thing for the past year. And right now it's been looking great. And we've been talking about this on my show is, you know, the S&P, it looks strong. It's making higher highs, making higher lows. Now it's certainly meeting that, uh, that Powell hammer line and broke through it. And you know, Isaac, who knew that Isaac Newton would be such a great trader? He probably would have been fantastic if he just applied his first <laughs> law of motion, right? Which says that an right. object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion until met by an equal or opposite force. So with the chart that you've shown here today, what it looks like to me is that the Powell hammer you've identified as that equal or opposite force that's going to stop whichever trend it is, whether it was upside or downside. And, and you know, this one still looking great from a bullish perspective. And, you know, you have to go out and see where other movements happened. And on that S&P, you're looking at about 4,300. Um, on the NASDAQ 100, yeah, it's a little bit higher than that. <laughs> no, I, okay, so I'll go back to the S&P. No, it's okay, so, it's okay. Yeah. I was just, uh, the NASDAQ is a, a bit of an outlier, but, you know, when you zoom Well, up... what I was going to show you was that what we're seeing now in the S&P has already played out in the NASDAQ. But, yeah, this 4,300 certainly would be a level. So, again, you know, as a trader, you could say, okay, yeah, here, we're going to have this impulse move, which we believe, you know, like you said, the force is – still in an uptrend, but what's the risk reward on this one, right? So, you know, you're, you know, you're 4,300, 43 and a quarter might be your level of resistance. You know, how am I willing to take the risk on the long side at this point, you know, and better make sure that my risk is limited right. looking at that target, which, which is nice about the pile hammer is now we know where we're wrong, right? And that would be as if we got above here and then back below it, right? So 4150. So am I willing to risk, you know, a hundred S P points to make a hundred S P points? Probably not, nope. right? Um, but it doesn't mean that it can't go higher. Now let's look at you know the Nasdaq in the same scenario, right? It came in that zone. It reacted to the zone multiple times. Now, it didn't get a big impulse away, but once it cleared, right, once it got that confirmation away, you know, look what happened to those August highs. It just literally ran right through them. Now, how, that how, let me ask you this. Be... How long do you keep those in your mind? Like when you look at a price chart like this, you know, you've got that pal hammer, which goes back you know, over, um, well, a little less than a year. Um at a certain point, you have to look at it and go, okay, the validity of that one is gone. And in this example you have here of, what is this? This is the uh, the NASDAQ 100. You know, you were looking at where it rifled, rifled through it back in April, kind of chopped through there for a little bit, which to me would have eaten up some of that supply if it was there. Do you right. still put a lot of emphasis on it because it's the pal hammer or because it had a breakaway from that zone now? So normally I would say no. I would say after after the fact, right, it's like you said, it's been used up, eaten up, mm -hmm. right? That's, you know, or you know, however you want to define it, and, you know, and again, for chart patterns, you know, old support, new resistance, right? But if if you've gone through a level two or three times, you know, then you kind of wipe that off your books, right? I would agree with you. But 
you know, let's look at, for instance, like, um, I think this is Kraft Heinz. Kraft Heinz, yeah. Um, and this is not unique to Kraft Heinz in terms of what I'm seeing here is what is happening with the pal hammer is now it's becoming kind of like this, this seesaw, this, this swing pivot where price, something happens when we come back to it. Right. I mean, we've, we've been above and below this line now, what three, four or five yeah. different times, right. but you can see how prevalent this level is on let's say a micro level, right? It's like it, it, here, here it held support, and then when it broke away, it fell hard, and it became resistance, right? Based, and then it broke away, and then when it fell hard, it became resistance. So this is not unique. So that's what I think is this zone is so interesting. Is that even markets that have been above and below multiple times? It still becomes a relevant zone, which is very fascinating to me. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, uh, we're behavioral analysis. Like you and I end up being psychologists and reading. These are our Rorschach pictures we have to look at. And figure, <laughs> <laughs> what do you see? I see a dolphin with rainbows. <laughs> yeah, what is that? It looks like a kitty cat with big eyebrows. <laughs> um, so you know, I just wanted to share this with you know your audience, and I share this with my bar chart audience because. It, no matter what market, I mean, you know, it, to a certain degree, you know, if you, you know, just, you know, call on any market, we can look at it and we can see that, that something happened at the Powell Hammer and not only something happened, but there was probably a great, you know, trading opportunity. I mean, just call on any, any market. Right. And, um, and markets have memory of it. And again, I think it has to do yes. with just us looking for behavioral patterns and, and capitalizing on it. And yeah. I think the point to make there is, Regardless of what you're looking at here at the S and P, if you're trading that zone, he's got marked as the Powell hammer. Make sure you have your stop losses in place because you know, and it, it everything works until it doesn't. And while it, it is a, a logical right. zone, um, it may uh, it may rip right through that. Rob says Batman ears. That's a that's a whole different pattern there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Little Batman well, ear pattern. <laughs> um, but you know, there's a lot of markets that have not tested the Powell hammer yet. Mm -hmm. And the, the example was, you know, the one I gave you was was Amazon. And there's a lot of uh, markets that have now gotten above it. So what now what is that I'm using this for, especially those markets that have now gotten above it? You know how some folks use like the 200 day as like their their on off switch in yep. terms of, well, I'll buy if we're above the 200 day moving average or I'll sell if mm -hmm. I'm below the 200 day, right? That's kind of their permission tool. Like right? that's kind of like the standard in, in uh, right. institutional from a long term value, investor right? perspective. Yeah. 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 So what I'm using this now as the pile hammer is I'm using it like the 200 day moving average. In other words, if I'm above the pile hammer, I'm going to be more inclined to be looking for buying opportunities or watching the trend as it as it goes above or if i'm below the power hammer then i'm more inclined to look for downtrends and more inclined to take short positions or options positions so it's kind of like this tool that i'm using now that is giving me permission to look for certain trade opportunities just as you would use let's say the 200 day moving average you know, to give you for a long term investor to give you the permission to go long uh, and equity. Right. And, you know, this is going back into uh, the lessons that I've done here multiple times about trade plans. And what I think is interesting about what you bring into the conversation today is this is it's a it's a price pattern. It's an engulfing pattern. And you're saying I'm establishing rules around it. Now, you're putting extra weight on this one because it was really caused because of Jerome Powell, which we all know is probably the most powerful person in the world at this point for the financial market. So, you know, that adds extra weight. And, and John's saying, all right, well, this is something that I'm going to use as a catalyst for either short trades or long trades based off of that specific zone. And we'll get new ones, right? For example, in less than two weeks, Jerome Powell will be making his speech on the 14th, the FOMC meeting. Um, I don't think the announcement's going to be that important. I think it'll be more important just 30 minutes after that when he has his press conference and gets grilled about what's going to happen going forward, you could see huge swings, right? very volatile swings out there. And we may get some new Powell hammers being formed and uh, then we'll have the whole new discussion all over again. Yeah. And like you said, there's multiple times. I mean, 
And each market is individual, right? And they're, like you said, earnings or something that are new story, and they could create a price pattern that you could trade off of. But what I'm saying is on this one, the pile hammer is that this uniqueness of what happened on those particular that particular two two particular days, mm -hmm. and then as we're moving on into the future, where we normally would discount something like this over time. It just keeps repeating, right? It's, this zone keeps showing up, right? Either as a supply zone or it, a, it maintains a, its validity. Yes, exactly. In terms of probability, and I think that is what makes it very fascinating. Now, again, like you said, you know, the first time, a second time, you can use the zone itself as you know, and a risk reward, you know, based on if price gets above it or below it. Um, but moving forward, it's more about this using this as an enhancement of let's say I'm in an uptrend or I'm in a downtrend, you know, what, where am I in the relationship to the zone? If I'm above the zone, then I'm more inclined to say, Hey, I'm in, I'm in a very strong up pattern because I've now cleared this huge obstacle that has made um, resistance for multiple, multiple equities. All right, price pattern recognition and the Powell hammer was our first topic. Um, I, I have a couple questions coming in, and, and one that I think is going to be of interest is the natural gas one. So you had mentioned, uh -huh. I think last time you were on the program, that you really felt kind of two bucks was the floor. You know, these last couple of days have been just brutal for natural gas and screaming towards two for the June contract, um, where we're at 215 or 216 right now. Uh, any any hope on the horizon for natural gas? You see anything there? It's a catalyst, or is this just keep on slipping slowly lower? Well, you know, I, I actually we talked about this on the market to close. I said that I thought the floor was definitely set in back in May, which was probably the June contract, and that was just below um, uh, two dollars. But I did say that as we looked at the forward contracts, what I would wanted to look for was that let's see if we can hold. Now, here's a chart here where I'm using a nearby, which in other words, it's a, con a continuous chart. And the pink lines represent oh, you're um, not, you're not that floor. Right? Right? That's, oh, excuse me. You sharing it? Um, no, I don't, Do I, I don't. You haven't shared yours. Okay. Bring that one up here in just a second. Yep. Yeah, sorry, my friends. There you go. So yeah, so the pink lines represent that that floor bottom that was created based on the uh, I think it was the June expiring contract. But I, what I said was that I wouldn't be surprised that the floor bottom of two dollars was put in place. But as we look at forward contracts, that they could come back to their historical lows. Now I'm going to move away from a daily near pie or continuous chart where I'm going to go to a contract specific chart. And that's what these blue lines represent. Um, and that would have been the contract low for the July. So now we see July is below the contract low. So now, yeah, I think the market is kind of acting a little ugly, but I still think that $2 is kind of that floor. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, natural gas prices go lower. Now, from a fundamental aspect, you know, supply is, you know, production is still increasing or is maintaining a high level. Um, although, you know, if we go six months to a year out, um, the, the capital expenditures or new wells or new, you know, that is starting is going to start to affect the market. Um, many of the larger natural gas producers are saying that they can't make money at these prices, so right. they might start shutting in gas. So those things will take time to run through. Now, what folks don't realize is every time they drill an oil well, you get natural gas. And a lot of oil wells at the end of their life actually create more natural gas. Right. So there's still a lot of gas production out there. Um, and the other thing that w has helped natural gas in the past is the LNG market, right? The liquefied right. natural gas and that in areas like Europe and Asia, where last year they had a low supply and that was what drove natural gas to extraordinary values this year, that has now alleviated itself as well. So the fundamentals don't look very strong. 
But as a trader, from an equities standpoint, I think that you can start looking to be more of a buy a dips type mentality. Mm -hmm. Although I still think there's some more risk to the downside. Yeah, Does and I think if sense? you're doing that, you got to be careful with things like um, if you're using boil, which you know you got these doubles and triples out yeah. there. Be careful because. If you're in UNG, it's one thing to hold them long term. You will get some time decay, but as you use these leverage instruments, that time decay or that decay, as longer you hold it, uh, gets much more pronounced. So you may buy something when natural gas is at, at two, and then six months later, it's still at two, but you bought boil, and now you're down 30, 40 percent because right. of the time be, decay. Be aware. You know, what I, my advice on the boil market the, the, in that one particular is if you see a well defined trend, um, one way or the other, you know, the, 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 um, I think what's the cold, cold is the inverse, um, leverage natural gas, uh, C O L D, I think it is. If you see a defined trend, then those instruments are very good for that, right? But what you have to realize is that every time at the end of the day, they recalculate or, you know, how they do calculate the derivatives that they use to get that leverage. Right. And so if you're holding this for a long-term investment, you're 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 fighting that recalculation everything. So it's a good short-term instrument. And when I mean short-term, I mean like 3 days, 5 days, maybe a week or two. Um if you have a long, you know, a nice defined trend then, you know, a longer period of time. But if you're in a sideways market, which we're kind of doing here, yeah, you're just ending up chopping yourself up. Now, if you wanted a little bit of a longer term perspective and you want to trade ETFs, then the L and G would be the better one. Um, but again, you got to worry about, you know, rollover and as you move to forward contracts. And, you know, here we are in the July contract is trading $2.15. I know if you look at, let's say, the next uh, time when we can anticipate natural gas prices to rally, which would be, you know, in the fall and the winter, you know, those prices are still way above current prices. So your your ETF has to buy a higher price contract mm -hmm. so that you might not get that price appreciation because as the as price ro rolls forward, right, the, you know, you might actually lose money because you have paid this kind of negative dividend as you roll into a more expensive contract. I don't know if that makes sense. In no, Portland, it does, but. because if they're buying the, the next contract out and have to pay more money, you don't get the gains that are there. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Sense. Right. Um, what other things can uh, what are you up to? I was going to share some stuff that you might be doing here, and I know you've got um, – I'm going to go out to your bar chart over here. Um we go to the learn side. Let me bring this up for you all. Um, is this pretty much where you spend most of your time is on the learn side, the webinars, archive webinars, yeah. and, and your show? Yeah. So actually, um, let's do this. Go where, Do you see where it says resources, site, education? Um, no, but I will find it. Resources. Below. below. Okay. So you're on the learn, right? Learn, you yeah. got bar chart webinars, bar chart yeah. live. The live show is that Friday show. And then right there is resources, site, education. See that? Um, resources. <laughs> Damn, but where is it? Yeah, let me share. Yeah, share. Um, obviously, I'm not. Am I sharing? It. Yeah, hang on. I can see your screen. They can, but um, okay. Side education. Um, there we go. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. And then down here it says new site members pages of interest. There is the pal hammer. So, um, you know, a little write up about how I how I use it and how you can draw the zone and how you can use it for risk management and a couple of examples. Nice. But, um, so yeah, how, often do you, how often do you write articles? Cause I know you, I know you do your show every Friday. Um, and then, then you do your webinars on Wednesdays. So you got, yeah, I don't, I don't write a lot of articles. I really just do a lot of these, um, educational webinars and these live shows. So, I mean, I do write for them, you know, writing the scripts and stuff. So I'm doing a lot of writing more so than I ever thought I'd ever do. Um, but no, I don't write a lot of articles for the site itself. I'm more creating more of these, um, uh, these webinars. And the one that's coming up next week is the squeeze by John Carter. Now he's a famous uh, yeah. trader and also, market technician and one of his uh, 
uh, tools that he uses called the the squeeze, and is based on theory that when the Bollinger band it bandwidth pinched. gets inside of the Keltner uh, channels, that's telling you the market is really coiled and condensed, and it's getting ready for a big volatility move. And um, so we think it's such a powerful tool that um, when you go into our templates, you can create, which is cool about Barchard, you can create templates of your own. And I have multiple ones, but we have some default templates and we do use the squeeze and it gives you those indications of trading opportunities based on the theory of John Carter um, and I'm going to do a webinar on that, how to use this template and how do you re read the chart in terms of uh, trading opportunities. Nice. That'll be a good one. I, I know John, I've uh, did the trade show circuit with him for many years back in the, in the two thousands. So good guy. V fascinating individual. And I'm super, super intelligent too. Right. Yeah, very. Well, you can have another uh, super, super intelligent guest on your webinar yeah. on the 28th of <laughs> well, yeah, we haven't announced it yet, but there is a rumor I heard that your my very own best friend Marlon is going to come on, and we're going to do a session on cryptocurrency. So look for that. Um, and we're you and I have been working hard putting this together, and I'm looking Hopefully forward to month. doing Hopefully that. Hopefully this month. Hopefully this month. Yeah, it's not official yet, but uh, it it's good. It's going to happen. And, and uh, that date, what tentatively right now is June 28th. So I'm looking forward to that. And I know, um, based on the work that you and I have already done, the preliminary work, that you're pretty excited about it as well, right? I am. I'm actually more excited that, you know, I get to interview you here all the time. And I don't know if you enjoy that or not. I think you do. But I don't get interviewed very often. So, man, you better uh, have your, your, your buzzers like to cut me off because, you know, I like to go and talk about this uh, stuff. Don't so. worry. I got my pencil and I got all my... All my questions already, and I'm going to grill you like a hamburger on 4th of July. Bring it on, or a tofu burger. I don't want to offend any vegetarians <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that will wrap it up for today. Again, uh, guys, we had John Roland on today. If you want to know more information, visit the chart I have over here, which is barchart.com. You can follow them on Twitter as well. They put out a ton of fun, engaging content. And they likes to pick on Jim Cramer a little bit, I noticed, which is one of my yeah, favorite things Yeah, we do, we do, do pick on him a little bit. <laughs> it's easy to do. He's, he's definitely yeah. making himself a great target. Yeah, he's a big, giant target on his back, right? You know what? He's laughing all the way to the bank. But anyway, check out the, yeah. check out Bar Chart on Twitter. Check them out at their website, which is barchart.com, and uh, sign up there for the premiere so you get access to all these different services they have there. So. Awesome, John. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on today as usual. Um, you know, it's been, been a while since you've been on here, but I look forward to working with you on bar chart stuff or coming back on this program for more, more education and information. Yeah, always my pleasure, my friend, and the best of you and the good of all trading. Sounds good. Take care, my friend. All right. Let me uh, real quickly answer a couple questions here. That one that came in. Let me get these headphones out. Oh, man. Doing a show with headphones is so different. Oh, I can hear. Um, there was one question I might want to get to. Uh, where was it? Damn it. Okay. Can you do? Oh, uh, Mike, you asked. Can you find the? It's the Powell hammer, as in Jerome Powell. And there's the the wonderful graphic right there. And what he's saying there with the Powell hammer is, it's just simply an engulfing formation. So when I look at, um, I know we don't want to do that. Well, let's go to. Oh. When you look at the formation, this is just simply an engulfing formation, right? You have a small candle right here, this green one, and then all of a sudden the next day is this monstrous engulfing. And the only way you can have this huge red candle that formed on, what, August 26th is an imbalance in supply and demand, right? That's really the bottom line to it. So his version of a Powell hammer is really a giant engulfing pattern, but caused because of Jerome Powell. And he's using that as kind of a line that he'll reference going forward as a supply level in this case, because price sold off. But you could also have a, a Powell hammer, uh, well, I guess you could call it, this is technically a, a Powell bearish engulfing, right? Not really a hammer formation, but it does look like a big hammer up there. So he's, that's his definition of it, is saying it's this engulfing formation. He's calling it a hammer because it just crushed the market. But I would argue we could probably have that facing the other way as well and utilizing that as a demand zone if we saw it the opposite direction. In this case, it's a supply zone. As you saw, I think you mentioned Apple was creeping towards that line as well. 
All right. Um, hey, Yoki, I'm going to see you. Yes, I'm all healthy. For those of you who were supposed to be in the uh, digital asset session last night, it's weird. I did a, um, a set, two sessions for OTA yesterday, and I did, or I, I did one. I didn't realize I was supposed to do two. So I did a 10 a.m. XLT general session, which I thought was my digital assets class. So I went about my day. Everything was growing great. And then um, I realized because Joachim messaged me, he said, hey, uh, you okay? You were in, we were in this digital assets session. I had no idea that I was supposed to do a session last night. So I apologize for that, Joachim. We'll make up for it one of these days. All right. Uh, Rob says, wait for the big one. Well, it'll be a, a fun webinar that John and I do. We always have a good time working together. It'll be different this time. He gets to ask me the questions. Uh, nothing happened. I just didn't, it wasn't even on my calendar. I can show you my phone. There's nothing on my calendar that said I had a class to, uh, that night. So some, somewhere a communication error, my, my apologies. All was good. I was, it was funny is the digital assets. I usually have maybe 20 or 30 people in there, but all of a sudden that morning session I had like 180, I think 185 was my maximum number. I'm like, whoa, what is going on in here? It was the XLT general session. I had a bunch of people in that one. All right, um, let's see. Did I have other questions I wanted to get to? No, I'm going to wrap this one up. Yeah, I did miss a session, which is kind of surprising for me. I am usually very on time, very prompt. I hate being late, so the fact that I missed that one kind of irritates me, but not much I can do. Uh, let's go and look at your economic calendar for tomorrow. So I will bring this one up for you guys here. Uh, let's see, this is June 1st. Tomorrow, we'll scroll down to our Thursday. Actually, real quick, let's talk about today's economic data because the um, ADP non-farm employment change came out a lot higher than expected, right? They were 281,000 was the previous number. They thought it was going to be 173,000. So they thought a contraction. There was a lot more jobs created than they anticipated. So that's a relatively positive sign for the market going forward. Uh, of course, you had ISM, ISM manufacturing numbers, which were slightly lower than expected for the manufacturing PMI, and prices were dropping as well. So from an inflationary perspective, this is actually rather good, which is part of the reason I think you saw some nice bullish markets. And lastly, uh, before I get to Rob's comment here, uh, is let's look at the Fed Funds futures, guys. This in the last... 24 or 48 hours it's been a huge swing the opposite direction again i have been saying all along that i am in the camp of a rate pause i don't see them raising at 25 basis points but you go back a few days it was like a 71 percent chance of a raise of 25 basis points and look how quickly it's changed and it's falling right now uh, at this point they're looking at an 81 percent chance of a halt at the next meeting which is coming up on june 14th so this will be very volatile over the next two weeks as we get to jerome powell's uh definitive announcement but this is kind of what i think was going to happen i've been saying this since the last announcement i believe though will they will pause see how the economy shapes up with these uh current rate hikes and see if they need to make adjustments for the end of the year so that wanted to bring that one up that was a big change now the other piece that uh rob is mentioning is uup so I have this tail as well. So this is what's called a fat finger. Now, I don't know exactly who did this, but you look at this and you're like, there's no way that could have happened, right? It looks like an outlier. It's by far the biggest candle that you've ever seen on UUP. Because like this, this big move here is one candle. Now, UUP is a US dollar uh, index. It's, it's long dollar ETF. So what I'll do is I'll split this up into, let's say, a five minute chart. Right? I'm going to do it in two time frames, but here's your five minutes. And you notice that during the course of the day, there's not a lot of volume on this thing. It's actually very light. It does not trade much at all. And on average, it looks to be like maybe 16,000 or 10, yeah, just a few thousand. So let's call it 5,000 actually. It looks like the, the average. 5,000 shares of UUP traded every five minutes. And then all of a sudden, this one window minute or this five minute bar right here, you had 212 thousand shares traded so that's a fat finger or somebody who doesn't understand trading because if you have a big I, I always mention this with you guys i say if you're trading something that's thinly traded and doesn't have a lot of liquidity you can't trade big share size right you, you're going to move the market so what happened here and i switch it now to a one minute time frame so you guys can see how big this was all of a sudden in one minute it was 198,000 shares traded like sold and it just caused a huge drop in this because there's no liquidity on this bad boy it just completely fell apart rallied back up and now it's right back up to where it was so this is the problem again of, of low liquidity and trading big share size this is a novice whoever did this did not understand the principles of liquidity and getting out so i wouldn't say this is a precursor to a, a market low this is just somebody who unloaded a huge block or 
of shares in a very thinly traded market. So, you know, UUP is right back up where it was. So kind of crazy. <clears throat> um, oh, align it with the Dixie? You can bring that one up. Let's do that. Let's go to, let me start with the daily and then we'll just add on the Dixie. Go DXY. All, and we'll do, boom, add that. So there you go. So there was a little bit of downside move today on the dollar, but nothing near what you had with UUP. So what happened is the dollar started drifting down right near the close. Uh, let's see, not near the close. Let me go to the five, three minute chart here. So you notice that the dollar index did not, the Dixie didn't tank like that. Somebody just sent a big sell order on UUP. That's all. And here, let's look at the, uh, let's look at DXY by itself, just so we can see. Okay, now I've got two things going on here. Let me get that one off and take the dollar index off. So there's your three minute of the dollar index. You see there was no big sell off there. Yeah, I remember it happened with GDX, but what happened with GDX was unique, Rob. So those who might be new to the show, Rob had some really interesting things happen. There was a period of time where it was GDX and you sent another one as well, where on his app, and I forget who you're using, I think it was Ameritrade, right? Or Thinkorswim. It was showing these crazy out of the money prints that weren't showing up on any of my charts on other platforms. And then all of a sudden price like gravitated towards those levels, which was very interesting. This level here looks like it's pretty clear um, and, and available to everybody, which is why it leads me to believe it's a fat finger, fat finger transaction. So that was your economic announcements. As far as earnings go, there's really nothing important for tomorrow, but today there was some interesting ones. We talked about Lululemon, which was jumping in the after hours session. So no uh, no work, no worry about wokeism going on at Lululemon, per my example, yesterday. Uh, up 13% on a pretty good earnings beat. You had Macy's beat earnings as well. Uh, the one that missed and missed badly was Dollar General. They missed on their earnings slightly, down almost 20%. Mm -mm. Yeah, it could be, it could be, you know, and. I'm a firm believer, Rob, that there's people out there that are sending messages through price charts. I believe that there is a way to do it. So, you know, maybe if I'm looking at, let's bring up gold as an example. Um, I'm looking at here at GLD, and let's say I think it's gonna fall to 1988. So what I'll do is I'll sell one, one contract or one share of GLD at this 1988 level. And that ends up looking to the network out there. It's like, oh, wait a minute. What's, it looks like an outlier print, but my, that might be a signal to somebody else that, um, that that's where it's going to be headed. And you know, the SEC says they're watching all this stuff. I read some report that the SEC monitors all the connections and friends and relationships and golf partners of anybody who is a heavy hitter in the financial markets, to which I say, absolute BS. Yeah, no, Oliver, I, I, I remember yesterday I was making the example of wokeism impacting uh, Lululemon, right? Lululemons and transgender probably going to be okay. Um, it was meant to be a joke yesterday, but anyway, uh, yeah, they had that negative the employee issue where they got robbed and they called the police uh, and the employees got fired. That doesn't make any sense to me. Really just the weird world we live in. Weird world we live in. Uh, all right, so for tomorrow, you have economic announcements. Let me bring that one up. I was actually just getting there with the Forex factory. I'll scroll that down here. And there's what you got cooking for tomorrow. And this is actually fairly important, right? You had the ADP non-farm employment change painting a rosy picture of job creation. However, we've had the expectation right now that unemployment was rising or is going to rise. They think it's gonna go from 3.4 to 3.5%. Honestly, who cares? Um, the market will react, but it's so low, I don't think it's that big of a deal. What will be kind of nerve wracking for the market is if we get a jump that's higher than 3.5. You know, if it all of a sudden jumps to 3.7 or eight, um, then I think we could see some some issues. Even though it's still historically low, it's the rate of change that would be of concern. And here you can see the long-term picture of your unemployment rate here in the United States. You know, I'll scroll in to where we kind of flatlined. Yeah, you know, having a pop-up in the unemployment rate would really be no big deal. Um, I don't think it'd be a problem at all. We are well past full employment, which the Fed said was 5%. So there we go. Um, it's art, not science. And it is. And speaking of art and science combined, uh, there were more headlines today about uh, hedge funds now laying off some of their mid-tier uh, workers because of AI implementation using ChatGP in the corporation. So that snowball is starting to, starting to build up some momentum. Layoffs may start hitting here 
real soon. All right, that's going to do it for me, everybody. I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to go uh, take the dog to the park, hopefully, before it, uh, it looks like it's going to rain out here today in Southern California. Powell said he wanted unemployment higher. I, I, I don't know if he necessarily wants it higher. I think he's okay with it being higher, right? There was this huge push back in uh, 2009 when we really were, you know, very high in unemployment to get it to full employment. That's what... Um, Jerome Powell or, or Ben Bernanke and Jenny Ellen kept saying full employment, full employment, full employment. And to them, full employment was five, I think five and a half percent. So now we're here, here at 3.4 percent. Like we're way low. I mean, you, you, you can't get much lower on the unemployment rate in the U.S., right? Call it pretty much full employment. So getting it popped up to five percent would still not be that big of a deal. Anyway, um, tomorrow's unemployment number will have an impact on the markets. We didn't really look at the markets today, so uh, I, will, I will catch us all up to speed on that one for tomorrow, what happened in our weekend edition. It's hard to believe that this has gone so quickly this week. Uh, of course, we'd have a short week with uh, no Monday session. But anyway, that'll wrap it up. If you guys have comments, questions, things you want me to cover for tomorrow's show, send them on in. TraderMarone at gmail.com is how you can get those sent in. Or as um, several of you do, like Les, put them down below the YouTube video and I will bring those on to tomorrow's show and give us something to talk about as I have a nice sip of whiskey tomorrow. All right, everybody, that's going to do it. Take care. Have a fantastic remainder of your evening. I'll see you tomorrow.